is Kristen Monroe, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the uh, UCI Interdisciplinary Center for the Scientific Study of Ethics and Morality. And it's our great pleasure tonight to have Kenneth Arrow. Um, we are going to be, um, I should acknowledge a couple people first. Sandy Cushman, is she still here? She always walks out of the room before, oh, there she is, good. Sandy managed to put everything together, so we're very grateful for her help. She basically runs the center with the interference with the faculty, so thank you, Sandy, for everything. Um, I should also thank Julie Margolis, or Jules Margolis now, since he was the one who made the initial contact for us, and we've drawn on his long-standing friendship with um, Ken to come tonight. And I'd like to thank the Department of Economics, the Department of Political Science, the Program in History and Philosophy of Science, the Department of Philosophy, Sigma Chi, the Scientific Research Center at UCI, and the School of Social Science. In addition to that, I'd like to thank Betty Vaughn and Frank Lynch for their support of the center in these particular events. Um, so, the center was set, uh, set up to try to encourage um, people to look at ethics using the tools of science, and our guest tonight is, exemplifies this beautifully. Um, he received his, <coughs> his um, bachelor's degree from the City College of New York in 1940. He then got a master's degree and, and a PhD from Columbia University, and is currently professor emeritus and economics at Stanford. Perhaps his most significant works are his contributions to social choice theory, notably Errol's impossibility theorem, and his work on general equilibrium analysis. But he's also provided foundational work in many other areas of economics, including endogenous growth theory and information economics. Uh, his many professional affiliations and honors. I'll only read a few of them since we want to get out of here before midnight. Um, National Academy of Science uh, is a member, member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the Econometric Society, which he is a fellow and past president, American Economic Association, which he is a distinguished fellow and past president, Institute of Management Sciences, of which he is past president, Western Economic Association, also past president. This is getting a little boring, isn't it? American <laughs> Statistical Society. Association, British Academy, Finnish Academy of Arts and Sciences, Institute of Medicine, Institute of <laughs> Mathematical Sciences, uh, Mathematical Statistics, American Association for the Advancement of Science, International Economic Association, my favorite, the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, which he explained what that was at dinner tonight, um, and of course the Nobel Prize. Um, and most recently he was awarded the National Science Award from President George Bush. So without further ado, Professor Barrow, thank you. Thank you, Chris. The, what I'm going uh, to discuss today is not by any means a completed work. I, I mean, like to finish things off, at least up to a certain point, establish possibility and impossibility, uh, a formula. I don't have anything like that today. This is regarded as a work in progress. Uh, Briefly, to state the underlying thesis, I think there's a special uh, role of children in the usual analy analyses of social decision making, of social valuation, is not symmetrical with that of adults. And the uh, idea of a social system, of a value system, of a decision system, you can use different terms, um, of, a, of an evaluation of society <clears throat> in terms of the consequences to its members uh, uh, puts a special burden, a special obligation on parents. Uh, and so, uh, as you're aware, my, most uh, theories of value like utilitarianism or some of the things talk either in terms of uh, the benefits, the, the pursuit of happiness, the uh, achievement of ends, and the achievement of, uh, of uh, preferences, or they are stated in terms of rights to this and that. What I really want to stress is another theme, which of course certainly philosophers have discussed, that of obligations. Uh, the, in this particular case, it's the obligations on those who have charge of children, obligations to see that they're represented in the, uh, in the outcome of the social process, and especially the natural trustees, I think that's the best word to use here, uh, 
for the children would have to be their parents. And I want to explore a little bit the logic of this, the, 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 way, this, the, the way these problems arise and in, in a practical sense, and something about, uh, at least there's some scattered statements about the empirical consequences and uh, background for these remarks. Uh, since it's so work and being, maybe this best thing would be to discuss it genetically in terms of how I came to be interested in the issue. Um, it arose from considering some quite mundane sounding questions, which are quite uh, very much in the mainstream of economics. And now, when you talk about parents and children, you may think that talking in economic terms is a rather strange way of approaching the problem. It's the using the icy waters of calculation uh, to uh, uh, drown idyllic relations, if I may paraphrase uh, Marx and Engels. The, um, <clears throat> it's the sort of thing that led Carlyle to talk about economics as the dismal science. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> uh, having, having given these various phrases, I would say that I believe the economic take on this social issue can be very useful. In any case, the reverse direction of causation is of great interest. How our evaluations of children affect our understanding of economic consequences is clearly of great importance for economics, whether or not it's of great importance in illuminating the parent-child relationship in a broader context. But I think these two are intimately related. <clears throat> <clears throat> Now we know that, of course, typically resources flow from parents to children. There's some qualifications of that which I'll discuss later, but uh, by and large, we expect resources to flow from parents to children, both individually and collectively. If we do this to the family, we do this to the state. Um, <clears throat> the child is typically maintained by the parents up to some point, and to an extent governed by both individual preferences and social norms enforced to some extent by the law. Inheritance and uh, inter vivos gifts are significant factors in the distribution of income. And these factors in turn affect economics because they are factors which govern savings and consumption. The willingness to save is in part a question of uh, the willingness to save for the future of your children, the willingness to consume maybe their consumption rather than your consumption. Um, and further, to take another example, savings does provide education, largely through, although not today, at least, not largely, though not entirely through collective means, at least uh, uh, education up through the 12th grade. Uh, we take the increasing concerns over the environment, and particularly in regard to the more permanent, lasting features, such as those embodied in climate change, but also other things are in part a concern for our children, but also, of course, for their children, and so on. Um, <clears throat> uh, my main scholarly concerns have been, concern have been um, dealt with this issue largely only through the considerations of the impact on economic growth, which is the savings, the pre preservation of opportunities for the future, and so forth, and especially the implications of environmental and resource uh, de degradation. But apart from that, and of course I'm just generally keeping up with the literature rather than in terms of my own immediate objects of research, a number of issues have come up which have bothered me. When I read things, I like to work them out, and sometimes there are puzzles that remain after I've read the document. And the first one was really, really a basically a minor issue in um, the work of uh, Professor Robert Fogel and Stanley Engerman, Time on the Cross. There were a lot of, that was a book, remember, about the economics of slavery. And uh, those of you who are involved in will remember there was, because of the inherent in the nature of the subject matter, there was a vast amount of controversy of it. And particularly, some fellow economic historians were very critical of some aspects of it. But one, but one, there was one, just one point, which really was a rather small point in the large discussion, but struck me as intellectually an diff, uh, interesting point. Um, Fogel and Engerman's book is uh, marked by a great many, uh, shall I say, courageous calculations. Um, they, and one of them was they attempted 
to measure the degree to which slaves were actually exploited. Now, the usual economic definition, you'd say, let's look at the productivity, what economists would call the marginal productivity of an individual, and compare it with his or her income. Or his or her, in the case of slaves, they don't directly have income, but they have consumption, which is their form of income. Now, this takes place over time, so you really want to take the total of consumption and what, to be exact, you discount the future consumptions, and you compare it with the total product of the individual over his life, totaled over his lifetime. If uh, the consumption, discounted consumption falls short of the discounted income, then we'd say the slave has been exploited, and you can, the, by the degree of the shortfall measures it. And if I recall correctly, Fogel and Engerman came up with a figure of roughly 10% exploitation. Whereas the consumption discounted was like 90% of the uh, um, of the uh, uh, of the product. Now, so they had on one hand an estimate of the productivity of a slave. They did some standard econometric estimates of, uh, of how much a slave would contribute, the marginal slave would contribute to the production of cotton, multiplied by the price of cotton an estimate of the dollar productivity. And of course you can consider this over the lifetime, over the working lifetime of slave. On the other hand, you have estimates derived from census figures and similar things on the uh, consumptions of slave children and, slave, and adult slaves. Now slaves started being productive at some given age, let's say 16. I, don't, I think that was the figure they used, but um, I didn't check. So they discounted <coughs> The productivities during the work, there was no productivity in other words, until 16 and then there was product productivity. So you have a sequence of productivity, you discount these back to birth. They simply discount the consumption back to birth and uh, you come up with a, uh, with a figure for, uh, uh, and compare those two figures, you get an idea of the degree of exploitation. Uh, I say in a genuinely competitive economy with free labor, those two should be equal. Um, now, one critic argued there was a fallacy in this. And the fallacy was, well, we, we don't really start people at birth, they don't start working, we should start them and their work during their working life. Uh, in other words, you should really discount production back to age 16 rather than back to, uh, uh, to birth. And similarly, you discount the future consumption back to 16. Now, there's one problem that's to be faced in this, namely <clears throat> that the, um, what happens to the consumption, where do you charge, the children's consumption after all, it's got to be charged up somewhere. Um, it, it occurred, it's an expenditure, it's a, re it's a re expenditure on one side and a receipt on the other. So the, nat the natural step, of the, uh, I don't remember the critic when to go into details like this, said, well, you've got to count then the child's consumption as consumption of the parent. You know, it's a, well, it's a family consumption. Um, which, and in fact, so that is more or less the way national income st ordinary statistics are in fact compiled. Uh, that, and that was his point. That's the normal thing is you look at families. You don't say, we don't look at the child as extended life, we look at the family. So you have to consider the consumption of the child in the, in the years uh, during the adult life as being, as being consumption of the parent to be discounted back to the uh, um, So in this, his argument is this, and if you carry this string carefully, then you find there isn't going to be much difference in the two approaches. There's going to be some. So from the practical point of view, it wasn't a big problem, but the question that bothered me, and suddenly we, they gave a limited answer to the way we ordinarily think about it. We think about individuals. And when we take, take things extending over time, we think about individuals through their lifetimes. But then what this critic uh, mentioned, uh, implied was that really that's not the way we do it, in, 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 at least in, the, in our capacity as national income statisticians. We take the, we charge the children, really amalgamate them with the parents and charge them as sort of, we, we, of course we calculate family income and family consumption. Um, now, okay, I just thought about this and it bothered me, but I didn't do anything about it. 
Um, uh, yeah, many years later, I gave a course, uh, several, uh, which I gave several times, on the distribution of income. The reason I gave the course, not because I was working on that subject, but because I felt it's a subject that is completely neglected in the curriculum. And, and since I was in a fairly position to choose the courses I offered, I gave a, uh, I got from one the district of income. Since I retired, the courses disappeared, so I was quite right to suppose that it was necessary for me to do it. Um, um, now, this, is a, this course is kind of a mixture of normative and descriptive elements. A good part of it is, you know, what do you mean by a measure of inequality? How do you define the inequality of income? And that, any such measure is really a normative statement. We, you know, we think we, one way of measuring it emphasizes one kind of thing, others emphasize something else, and you want to do it. I don't want to go into the question of measures of inequality, but I just mentioned the whole idea of the course is normative. But then, of course, there's a lot to the statistics. And as I've just said, and this reminded me of my previous worries, the statistics are in the form of family income. You look around, you don't find distribution income by individuals. We pool all family. We have figures on family income. Now, so we have a distribution. You say family, how many families have incomes between 90,000 and 100,000? How many have incomes between 10,000 and 15,000? That's the way we determine. How many families? The number, the size of the families didn't enter the story at all. If you look at the standard distributions on statistics, you will not find any mention of the size of the families. So the family is treated as a unit, regardless of size. And if we start with the idea we're interested in the welfare of individuals, there's a mismatch here. Um, and one particular aspect of this is, of course, that to take two families of the same income, what do we say about the larger family? Presumably, each person has less to spend, less to spend than each individual. That's a matter of arithmetic, not of economics. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, there are more people. So we might be tempted to say large families are, in some sense, poor. There are five, you got five poor people instead of uh, well, two rich people, or two well-off people. Um, that changes your pick. I, uh, I'm not saying you can't. Uh, there are, I can think of easily ways of correcting for this, by the way. So this suggested to me, in fact, a very simple representation. That a family, let's say, with income $50,000, annual income um, $50,000, containing five members, should really be thought of as five individuals, each with an annual income of $10,000. That would give a very different picture of the income statistics. Now, there are, don't, uh, let me say, that I'm aware of the fact that this simple-minded idea um, is subject to criticism. The trouble is the criticisms I've gotten argue even for even more, not for less complicated things. They don't argue for the presence, so they argue for even more complicated things. Just, just to show that I understand the issues, so though it's not really relevant to what I'm going to say, one problem is that the um, adults don't, somehow don't need as much, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, children don't need as much as adults. They're smaller, their stomachs are smaller, they're, they take up less space, uh, you know. So uh, somehow we should correct for the fact that, there are ch that children are not quite adults. It should, instead of considering five members, we'd have to say, th there are, let's say, three young children. They're, after three, they're not quite three, like two, <laughs> or something like that. Um, that uh, we have to I mean, adjust for that. The other is the fact that, um, well, there used to be a slogan that uh, um, two can live as cheaply as one. I don't know if that's, that slogan is still around. It was very common when I was young to talk about marriage. Now, they two can't live as cheaply as one, but they probably can live at less than twice the cost. There's economies of scale, as we economists say, and somehow, so the five-member people aren't quite as badly off as it looks because they're, they're getting advantages of joint production. But those are, those don't change. that's not really fundamental to the point I'm making. These are, these are sort of new, special adjustments have to be made. Um, now, these cases, these examples I've given, the two of them are not, are from a practical point of view, not trivial. They are significant in the measure of what, how, what is the, uh, the family distribution of income. What it, what, how, do we, how, how do we treat individuals? The children brought up in them are a large family with a, with a given income are somehow being deprived in some ways. And that somehow should get into the picture. Um, but they really, more, from a more fundamental point of view, they do illustrate the ambivalent relation 
between family and uh, its members. Uh, the, in economic, when you try to talk in, in, in fundamental economic terms about welfare, we always think of individuals. That's what's that's a picture in our mind. Um, in law, they're individuals. Even P, you know, children are individuals and have individual rights. They can be a criminal. Uh, they can be if, if something criminal is done, it's, it's, it's the same as if it's done to an adult. The legal the relations and other like civil relations, contractual relations, are different. And that's for reasons which I'll come to. Uh, so we're getting a kind of a, blur, a, blur, a blurry concept in our treatment of children. We look at it one way, say, well, they're part of the family. And look at it another way, well, they're individuals. And in a way, both foci uh, have some significance. <clears throat> now, I want to raise the issue, essentially, with not, not resolve it, but raise it, of an analytic representation of family structure, and especially the role of children. And really all I'm trying to do in this lecture is present what the issues are in that. The purpose is fundamentally, basically, uh, the issues are normative rather than descriptive, although the descriptive elements, because once you have a normative thing, as you say, children should enter in such a way, then you do want to be able to describe it that way. So they're not uh, normative, descriptive, not uh, uh, polar opposites. But the, the motivation is some normative idea of what is a good society taking account of the, uh, the Different, the, the fact that children aren't going to be treated quite the same way, are neither, neither are being neglected or considered quite the same way adults are. Um, it's in the economic terms, you want to start a welfare economics of the world in which children play a role, but not the same as that of adults. And all I'm going to do here is sketch some of the issues that such a formulation will have to address. Now, there's been a lot of literature trying to provide what is the basis for a good society. Um, and I'd say we notice two common elements in many of them. And these remarks apply to utilitarianism, to the idea that you just take people's happinesses, measure them, and add them up, um, which is the, util the utilitarian formulation since the days of Jeremy Bentham. They apply to John Rawls's attempt uh, to provide a concept of justice as fairness. And they apply to these what they call contractarian views from Thomas Hobbes uh, on, where, the, where there's some idea, well, there was a state of society, maybe some people think it's, it's clearly mythical, others think it's really having happened, but uh, some others think it's con a conceptual myth, that there's some society when people had no social connections and they formed a social connection, they agreed to form a social connection. The question is, what kind of a contract do they or would they have entered into? And uh, the Rawls concept, of course, has uh, much in common with many with this. Um, now, one element, and I see there are two elements, it seems to me, that, that you, if you look at these things, have in co uh, all these approaches have in common. One is that there's an element of parity or reciprocity among the members of the society, that each one has some obligation to the other, um, that they're all fully moral beings. Not, not a universal statement, there are, there are exceptions to that, but the other is that there's some kind of a mutual gain from social interaction, that each one can contribute. Let me discuss the reciprocity and parity. The way it's usually pointed is that people are um, all enter symmetrically into the discussion. Um, get this well, there was a philosopher of the last generation called Richard Hare, spoke about it, that moral propositions or ethical propositions have to be universalizable. You can't say, it's good for me, therefore, it's good. You, it must be, the statement must be equally true if I substitute for that name any other name. Um, and that's what you call a universalizable proposition. The, the, the one kind of argument starts in the so-called original position, it's, it's a, a contra an idealized contractarian argument, and John Rawls has done it, others have done it with a more utilitarian implication like William Vickery or John Arshani. Um, they sort of imagine there's some world which you get, enter an agreement and you don't know who you are. You don't know what your tastes are gonna be, for example, you don't know what your abilities are gonna be. You come to an agreement and then you, uh, you say, what agreement will I come to under those circumstances? 
uh, they come to different conclusions. That's rather interesting. With the same say, starting point, they do come to different conclusions as to what the agreement might be. But it's but they, all of these have all three of these have the same uh, uh, basic structure. In a way, one of the consequences of most of them is there's an idea of redistribution of income, which is really based on the idea, well, you know, I don't know before whether I'm going to be poor and you're going to be rich or vice versa. So let's agree in advance to somehow equalize or equalize to some extent. Or we know the details, of course, you know, which are extremely important in practice. I don't, to, I don't want to emphasize here. Uh, so you might say this is uh, kind of an insurance model of, um, of social obligation. The other point about it is usually a society, that's, it's good to be in society, and therefore it pays everyone to go into this social compact. Um, and this is the sort of thing that Thomas Hobbes famously uh, um, argued that uh, what he calls a state of nature, which life is what, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. If I, may, if I got that right, um, wonderful phrase, um, and that by joining together, you can make everybody imposing restrictions where people don't go around uh, stealing from each other and so forth. You can uh, make everybody better off. Now, take the conventional point of view of children, especially in the modern world, as not yet productive members of society then really children can provide neither insurance nor uh, contribute, nor can they contribute to the social gains. Um, uh, by the way, this kind of argument uh, applies even more strongly, though I don't want to develop it here, to unborn generations. People, in other words, why do we do something for the, for the distant future, for people who aren't even, when our children even aren't even here? Um, you know, they're, they're not going to do anything for us. <laughs> they can't help us in any way. They're not contributing. They're not, uh, they're not contributing by, their, by joining with us to our, uh, everybody's welfare. They're not uh, able to uh, provide any insurance function. Um, but I don't, that's uh, another, that's a, I want to get into that story in, in another time. By the way, the argument about insurance, I should be a little careful. There is a qualification to it. Uh, you, could, you can, and do have, of course, in some societies, and to some extent even in our society, you do have a reverse insurance. It's true children can't insure you now, but they, are, they can insure you in the future. And of course, the idea of children supporting parents in their old age is, an, is a very ancient obligation. And uh, we, to the extent that we have um, social security systems which are not completely funded, not really paid for completely by the uh, contributions of individuals in their lifetime, they, uh, we do have to this day a certain amount of contributions by the, from children to parents. So it's not the, you can't insure on a simultaneous basis, but you can insure on the basis of a, so to speak, a forward contract. Um, nevertheless, I think it's pretty clear the, ma the main, when you consider the maintenance, the upbringing, the education, all these things, the main flow of resources is still from parents to children. The savings looking at society as a whole, children are living off the accumulated capital of previous generations. Um, now this, the result is that because there's a mismatch between this underlying, these underlying principles which govern the way uh, theories of social obligation are formulated, of social well-being are formulated, and the reality is the difference between children and parents, the most theories of justice have really a great deal of difficulty accommodating the place of children. Um, Rawls, for example, does have a passage where he discusses what the obligations to save are. I think it's fair to say it's, they're totally unsatisfactory and not really in accord with his general theory. Um, both uh, Professor Parthenas Gupta and, and I have both written papers showing that if you take take what Rawls says literally, you get totally incoherent uh, implications, which he didn't draw. Um, the, um, you now, utilitarians, and I must say in practice, I use this kind of formulation, say, in discussing uh, environmental policy, uh, take, have a very fast, straightforward view, but it's not easy to justify it. Namely, you take your utilities of today's people, you take tomorrow, your utilities of tomorrow people, you discount them. You don't count them quite the same way. The discount of, of, of utilities two generations hence, 
discount it again, so it's the, the, and, and so forth, discount it twice. Uh, so you get a formula which is coherent and consistent, but it's not easy to justify <coughs> by any kind of rational argument. Can't, the, ar the original position arguments, which are sometimes used to justify utilitarianism, I could have been anybody, roughly, with equal probability, don't really cease to apply when you're talking about the and extensions over time, and especially in terms. Now, the, the empirical, uh, there's also been empirical work on the economics of the family, trying to explain like how many children do, do people want and how much they want to educate them, how much they want to invest in them. Let's say this is mostly Gary Becker and others who working along these lines. And here, um, uh, you might say children are treated as durable consumer goods. They, I mean, you want children because you get, you get pleasure out of your vacuum cleaner, you get pleasure out of children. That's roughly the same way that there's, there's only one difference, to be fair about it. In the Becker formulation, the welfare of children does enter into your, the welfare function of the parents. So while it's true they count the number of children, they also, at least in this formulation, care about their welfare. But that's already raising an issue because Who's to decide this welfare? Um, supposing the children are different from the parents. And I, the usual assumption is everybody's alike. It has the same kind of utility function. So these issues don't arise. But people are different. That's a crucial point about the world, that they're, they're respecting the autonomy of individuals. It's certainly something that most people who pressed, regardless of their school of thought, would say is, is a high value. <clears throat> Let me cons um, um, by the way, if you take the Becker point of view seriously, you might argue that the current practice of treating families as a unit is really correct. The children enter not as, a, as their welfare, but as a consumption item. And therefore, if you spend money on children, it's just as good as spending money on anything else, and then they cease to be individuals. The trouble is you do have a transition passage when the children cease to be children and become separate units, and that emergence becomes a little odd and uh, discontinuous. Uh, let me formulate, uh, uh, let, me, let me put this matter in somewhat different language. I hope I'm not pushing your attention too hard. Uh, supposing we, so we, let me be slightly, say, this, say some of the same things I've said, but in a slightly more abstract way. We have a society of individuals who must make a collective choice. What I think of is, uh, this is a very general formulation of a system of, um, of by which society determines outcomes. Uh, the economist may think of the outcome as the of allocation of resources, who gets what goods. You could want to take a more general perspective to allow other kinds of social, you may call them goods if you like, but they're not the things you buy and sell, the happiness of children, you know, let's say as reflected in, in, in family relationships or something of that kind. Um, and similarly in marital relationships. Um, Inherent in the usual economic analysis is some kind of methodological individualism, sometimes called, uh, to use a phrase that's sometimes used. In a general model of social choice, this means that the preferences of all individuals must be taken account in arriving at a social outcome. So we, the story we imagine is that every individual has a set of values. Uh, there, what, which social outcomes they think are good, which are bad. By social outcome, I mean, a complete description of what everybody gets, including the happiness and, uh, and so on. Um, both the market and the political system and their joint operation can be taken as sets of rules which for a given technologies determine the social outcomes. And that is say the distribution of consumption goods, jobs, ownership rights, levels of public goods and other things that you might want to legislate about or or have government policy about. But the, the, the outcomes depend on individual values, depends on what people want. But they're all, it's some kind of a synthesis. Now how you uh, express these preferences may depend on individual, it may arise in individual decisions, you may have collective decisions. But we think of even the individual decisions as arising, as being collective but delegated to, to individuals to make. Um, so it's essentially necessary for individuals to be able to express preferences. Um, 
The bias of economic analysis is to assume that the individuals, uh, an indivi uh, the individual rather, represents his or her values through some kind of actions. Uh, it could be through voting, it's an action. It could be through purchases on the market, purchases and sales on the market. It could be through action in intermediate institutions of civil society, uh, you know, philanthropy, uh, volunteer organizations, uh, so forth. Uh, and now it's also true, by the way, that in any society, certainly any system with an economic component, the possession of assets and productive abilities will cause an increase in the weight of one's individual value system. However, its outcome, better off you are, the more you're likely to count. Uh, and better off here means having more productive, more things to supply to society. So how do children fit into this picture? Well, they're limited in two ways. And probably the most important, the more important, is the inability to express their preferences or to understand the consequences of their actions. That's what we mean by having children. Um, secondly, they lack assets. And both of these, of course, are functions of age, so they uh, change with time. Let me just throw on something that I ran across recently. Um, This is William Blackstone, the 18th century commentator, who wrote the famous commentaries on the laws of England. And it really expresses this even better than I can realize it. Um, uh, you see that the argument is given that um, the, the parents have a duty to raise. This is, uh, to have, to have raised a question. How are, how are children's welfares or values or whatever expressed? And in fact, the answer is the parents have to express. They have to provide for the maintenance of their children. Um, and um, uh, well, uh, I'm not going to try to read what's here. Um, notice that they uh, uh, emphasize that the natural tendency of parents to, in, 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 to undertake these obligations is reinforced in the third paragraph by uh, law. <laughs> it's, not, it's not taken quite for granted that um, um, even though he says, though providence has done it more effectually than any laws, because it's a natural tendency, nevertheless, there are these laws. So um, then they go to the question of power of parents in terms of this. I think it's very old in our study of religion. I think it's a, a very interesting quotation. Um, so in other words, the children have to have a trustee because the children are incapable of expressing their preferences. And the trustee is also responsible for making up for the lack of assets that the child has. Now, we do all expect that the natural trustees are the parents. Um, the, the, uh, the fact that parents arrive, that evolution has created a situation in which parents are disposed naturally uh, at least at providence will replace that with evolution. But the uh, idea is the same um, as uh, by planting in the breast of a parent. And this is because obviously we know all the, especially with the prolonged childhood of humans compared to most other animals, but most, animals, most mammals and even other animals certainly have birds and so forth have a great deal of parental investment in things. So sometimes it's only maternal but in uh, many species, it is uh, 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 by both parents. Um, now, the system must be said to be worked uh, on the whole works very well. Just not just that there are problems. Um, uh, you know, it's what's, why I was struck by the fact that if you look at the Bible, you have many injunctions for children to honor their father and their mother. I didn't find any. I mean, I don't say I swear I don't know every line in the Bible. 
um, which is enjoin um, parents to be concerned about their children. Um, now, of course, one pessimistic interpretation is that children are not regarded as having any rights, they're just the property of their parents. But I think a more likely interpretation is that it's assumed that parental love is so strong that un unlike the love of children for parents, which does need reinforcement, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know why the fifth commandment is there, it's, uh, it, it, and it's repeated many times, that uh, it's unnecessary. And I think that's probably um, a reasonable thing. Uh, so this is an example of an obligation. It's not a pledge. It's not. A, we're not saying people are deserve their happiness, as the Declaration of Independence says. It's rather um, um, uh, it's. We, we don't find this. We find the discussions of. Uh, uh, we, don't, we don't find the word obligation used that much, especially in economic discourse or ethical discourse about economic arrangements. And I say we find happiness, or utility, as the economist says, or even as Amartya says, functions and capabilities. But these are kind of utility, in my opinion. A different language talks of rights, but I think that we, we need to talk about obligations. Uh, now, on the one hand, we do have a recognition that we, we do say that it's pretty clear most parents regard this as, as a basis. But the trouble is, it's not universal, and that's where the problem arises. A rather interesting, Milton Friedman, who was perhaps a strong libertarian, individualist, and all that, has defended compulsory education laws. Um, in his paper that attracted a great deal of attention, urging the private supply of education, he didn't dispute the idea that education should be required. It was only that it should be supplied privately, and he's quite clear, it's a perfectly clear statement that uh, the reason is the interests of parents are not necessarily the same as the interests of children. He says this quite explicitly. Uh, parents might like their children to go out and earn money for the family um, or work on the family farm or whatever, the, depending on the status, uh, the, what state of uh, the economy we're talking about. So we find, uh, even in um, um, libertarian circles, we find some evidences. Let me pass to some few scattered facts. Um, I'm, not do, I'm not doing an econometric or, or a sociometric study here. Uh, and the thought, when, every, when I use the word child, by the way, I'm referring to children as those under 18. That's the way the statistics come, and that's sort of not unreasonable. It is true that childhood is not, not today, at least in the United States, necessarily associated with poverty. Um, I was. I thought. I was. Also, the reason I mentioned that is I, would th I thought the contrary was true until, like, until my research assistant called the figures for me. Um, uh, Fifty-two percent of the children live in f in families whose incomes are in the top forty percent. So the top forty percent of the families have a disproportionate. A th of top forty percent by family income. I'm sorry. Top, if you t uh, top forty percent of, of families with as measured by family income have 52% of the children. Um, or put another way, if you, if you take a, something called the poverty level, 54% uh, of the children live in families whose incomes are 200% of the poverty level or more. Um, on the other hand, I've spoken repeatedly of parents, but that plural is subject is not, is not uh, unproblematic, to say the least, at least currently in the United States. I'm not using United States data. In uh, the year 2002, only 60% of the children lived in a household with two parents. By the way, parents here include step-parents, includes adoptive parents. So only 40% of the children live in single-parent or no-parent households. There are 4% that live in no-parent households. Um, now, there's been a vast literature on the impact in terms of education or future income of li coming, in a, coming from a single-headed family, correcting for income. Even, even at a given income level, educational uh, achievement, future income, is adversely, significantly adversely affected by coming from a single-parent household as opposed to a two-parent household. 
On top of that, of course, single parent households tend to be a good deal poorer than, than, than um, uh, two family households. You also have very strong figures on child neglect and abuse. Um, each year, about 1.3% of children are reported as being subject to abuse and or neglect. This is what's reported. It's going through, so that's the basis, official, some kind of official recognition. Now, if you compound that over 18 years of childhood, this means on the average, 20% of the children are abused or neglected sufficiently to be reported. Now, uh, hmm? Well, that's right. Now, I agree. But then, okay, but the average, you see what I mean is, okay, you're quite right. It could be that you have serial things, and that's why I don't know that, I was not trying to say that 20%, that's why I use the word on the average. 20%, it's not that 20% of the children have been abused at least once. It's, uh, some of them have been abused a lot more than once, so if you average it over them, uh, you're right. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's a, it's a, however you look at it, it's a big, so it means it's some extra, all right. If you say there are fewer children who have been abused, it means those who were abused were abused very heavily. Okay. Um, and it is, uh, there have been, I've seen other data uh, based more on self-reporting of adults rather than of things of how they've been severely abused. And they also show that something like 12 to 13 percent of children have been severely abused. I'm not sure what the operational meaning of severely abused, but as self-reported. And there's very considerable evidence, in fact, I think it's very strong evidence, that as a risk factor in adult depression, childhood abuse is an extremely important matter. The rate of depression among those who have been abused is just much higher than among others. So we're talking here, and as I'm saying, the system works, you know, 70 or 80 percent of the time. But we're talking about a system that does break down a non-trivial amount. Now. Uh, it certainly be premature on the basis. I don't have either formalism, or, nor do I really want to emerge into policy recommendations uh, on the basis of these few remarks. But it does suggest that there are policy problems. And the question of, of taking obligations to children. Now, we do have essentially criminal procedures. If you beat up a child, it's like beating up an adult, and therefore it's things that we, we treat it. We have a different set of personnel involved, but the, the idea is the same. You can put people in jail for beating up the children, so, so it's like ordinary criminal law. But that's a pretty, it's not a remedy which is very, uh, as, as it's, it's, a, you know, it's a remedy you certainly don't want to abandon, but it's not exactly one you want to completely rely on. Um, um, so what we find is that the present perception of obligations, the present system by which obligations are enforced, is failing a significant fraction of the children. Uh, now, we can start about increasing the role of the state, in other words, take the children away from the parents. But it's not a very satisfactory solution, as we know. It's, the, the state is not in a terribly good position to bring up children. And uh, for the abuse by foster parents is also a major phenomenon, not to, not to be neglected. Um, you get, of course, um, um, you know, every time that we get a serious case comes to the newspapers, you realize there's been a balancing act here. You say, well, it's terrible what happened, but um, the, you know, the choice was between leaving it with an underperforming family and giving it over to the state. And both of those outcomes are not things. Um, I don't know quite where, the, where, where, we go, where we go from here, frankly, in policy terms. It does seem to me that a major fraction of the single family houses are the result of divorce. And um, I think there's a good argument that maybe divorce laws have become too far. I think marriage, per se, is not, per, per marriage is, as such, is not a matter of any great social interest. Consenting adults are perfectly willing to say consenting adults have free choice, whatever they do. But when children are involved, I think the story changes completely. This is Blackstone's emphasis. There is a responsibility um, uh, created by the production of children, which applies to both parents. And of course, we, do, we know the situation is quite asymmetrical. Um, so there are, as economists would say, externalities. And however, the most intractable part of the problem, and I really don't know what to say about it, are those who were never married 
where you can, it's hard to think of what the appropriate legal remedy would be. On this gloomy note, I will come to a conclusion. I've asked a couple people to start off the discussion, and I'd like to call on Julia Fedorova for our first comments. Uh, Julia is in the political science department, and those of you who are astute will realize she has a special interest in this <laughs> issue. Thank you. Well, let me also say a few words how um, I became interested in this topic. Unlike Professor Arrow, um, un unlike Professor Arrow's interest, mine was completely unsci uns unscientific and trivial and driven merely by my desire and my decision to become a parent. Despite the difference in the arrival um, paths to this particular issue of p parents' responsibility to children, like Professor Arrow, although for a different reason, I faced the question of resources and a very well-realized necessity um, in the nearest future to divide the income of my family by three rather than by two. Of course, as Professor Arrow said, some economists may object to such a way of representing income distribution in a family. One of the underlying reasons for this objection is that children consume less and they need less space than adults. They eat less, they... Um, um, they are smaller, so they don't need so much space. In my view, this, in fact, is an empirical issue. Even before a baby is born, he or she indirectly become, becomes a part of family consumption. Trips to the doctors, uh, medical tests, vitamins, maternity clothes, eating for two, and so on and so forth are all elements on a family's changing uh, consumption pattern. And when a baby is born, um, her wardrobe seems uh, to change faster than that of a movie star. <laughs> True, a baby doesn't need a vehicle to drive, so this expense is out of the picture, uh, but he needs uh, an even more expensive childcare. Thus, as I said earlier, whether a child should or should not be counted as an equal to an adult consumer certainly seems to me as a question that we need to address empirically. It may very well be the case that in some cases a lot of parents would rather count their single child as two rather than one, rather than point, point 0.5. <laughs> in the second half of uh, Professor Eros' talk, uh, he raised the issue of obligations of parents to children. Surprisingly, as it turns out, um, the notion of parental duties has not been widely discussed in the scholarly literature. Uh, nor apparently has it been uh, widely discussed in the Bible. Maybe it is because parental love, which is strong as an, and unconditional to a great extent, presumes self-imposition of obligations on the part of the parents. Such self-regulation of parental duties, however, does not necessarily protect a, chi protect a child from parental tyranny, possible parental tyranny. Of course, there are laws that prohibit parents, for example, to leave their children unattended at home until a certain age or um, to put them into a car without a car seat until they reach a certain age. The majority of those laws, however, have to do with child safety. But how do we treat a situation when a father decides that his daughter doesn't need an education, for example, because her purpose in life is to be a wife and to have children on her own? And I'm not talking about remote countries. I'm talking about instances that have happened in the United States. How do we protect, how do we protect a child from his parents' aspirations for him to become a great athlete? And the trauma, psychological trauma mostly, that ch uh, this child experiences when he, in fact, wants to become a piano player. Would we, as parents, want to delegate more obligations to the state or would we, um, would we want an increasing role of the state in deciding what obligations we as parents must have to our children? Wouldn't we feel deprived of our parental rights with greater involvement of the state? 
Unfortunately, as Professor Arrow, I don't have definite answers to those questions. And all of them can be deb debated in one or um, another way. In conclusion, I would like to raise another important um, issue that Professor Arrow has touched in his talk, the, and which I think is a natural continuation of his talk. Although it was not, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I, and I'm talking about responsibilities that children have to parents, that grown-up children, ha uh, children have uh, to parents. And I would like also to wish everybody in the audience to extract, to be able to extract as much happiness, or as economists say, utility, from their obligations, both as children and as parents. Thank you. Uh, Philip Nickel. Thanks, Christian. Can you hear me? Just speak up. Speak up. OK. <laughs> Hillary Clinton, in her book, It Takes a Village and Other Lessons Children Teach Us, argues for a number of policy proposals, such as preschool and daycare, meant to respond directly to our responsibility for children. By our, here I mean the public in general, and by children, I mean not just one's own children, but all children in one's own society. On the continuum between our actual practices and those of Plato's Republic, say, where all children are raised collectively, Clinton's proposal is a little bit in the direction of the Republic. It has in common with the Republic that we have a primary responsibility for all children in our society. We must take care of all of them, we all must take care of all of them, and we are all directly obligated to do so. The difference is in how we respond to this obligation. In the Republic, we would raise them communally. In Clinton's America, we provide free or subsidized daycare, government volunteer partnerships, and so on. If it takes a village to raise a child, then the village is responsible for the success or failure of this project. Now, for all I will say here, Clinton's view might be right. We might well have these direct or primary responsibilities for other people's children. But in my brief remarks, I just want to make room for a different conception of responsibility for other people's children, perhaps more like that suggested in Professor Arrow's talk this evening. For lack of a better word, I will call it secondary responsibility for other people's children in contrast to the primary responsibility that Clinton thinks we have. This is real responsibility, but it's not quite the same kind. In order to elucidate this idea, consider a mundane example. Suppose a close friend or a spouse has high blood pressure and is trying to eat healthier food. If anybody has primary responsibility for the success of this project, it is the man himself. He is the one who has an obligation, presumably to himself, to change his habits and overcome whatever inclinations he has to eat badly. However, if I am his friend, I am indirectly or secondarily responsible for the success of his project. This amounts to two things. First, if there is nobody else who will do so, I must in a gentle way hold him responsible for what he eats. And second, I must do what I can to help him meet his primary responsibility, for example, by not eating unhealthy food right in front of him or giving him unhealthy food. Secondary responsibility consists of these two elements, holding another person responsible and helping to make it possible for him to fulfill his responsibility. <laughs> I propose that our responsibility that is the responsibility of all of us for children, that is all children in our society, has the same structure. Parents or legal guardians of children have primary responsibility for their own children's well-being and development. They have direct obligations to their children, which they sometimes fulfill adequately and sometimes not. The rest of us, whether or not we have children of our own or legal wards under our guardianship, have a secondary responsibility for other people's children. This amounts to two things. We must hold parents responsible for meeting their primary responsibility to their own children, and we must do what we can to help make it possible for them to fulfill their responsibilities to their own children. Creating a child brings one into a different kind of relationship than a marriage, friendship, or cooperative arrangement between adults. The child requires a primary caregiver and does not enter the relationship he has with this caregiver voluntarily. 
There are strong reasons for holding parents primarily responsible for the children to whom they give birth. In many cases, it is because the parents choose to have children. It is their own project, like eating less salt or building birdhouses. But of course, some people give birth to children even though they themselves have enough children for their liking, or even because, or even though they, have no, they want no children at all. Such people are nonetheless more responsible than I am for raising the children to whom they give birth. This is not because they are the only ones who could be primary, primarily responsible, but rather because the alternatives are unpalatable. If somebody else, unknown to me, has a child, it cannot be up to me to raise it. I may have enough children for my liking, or I may by choice have no children at all. An additional child might greatly interfere with my plans or the plans of those who rely on me. Suppose a babbling baby floats on a raft up to my deserted island on which I am living as a castaway. In that case, I have an obligation to care for it, but this is not fortunately the general situation. I resist being primarily held responsible for other people's children. Thus, secondary responsibility. The idea needs filling in, but its main point is assigning and facilitating the responsibility of others. Our last discussant is Mark Petraka, who I believe brought one of his con durable goods with him tonight, right? I left my children at home tonight. I wasn't going to have them here. That's exactly right, Professor Monroe, and in fact, um, the only thing that qualifies me to uh, comment this evening at all is the fact that I'm a parent, and uh, like Professor Tordova, who uh, somewhat more covertly than I, uh, I did bring uh, one of my children this evening in fulfillment, in fulfillment of my parental obligation to educate them, and I should tell you that he is here uh, not under duress. Uh, which is additionally interesting. Um, I want to make seven quick points because this is a rather daunting thing to, uh, I did have the benefit of, of reading um, uh, Professor Arrow's talk in advance, uh, which gives me less of an excuse uh, to be thoughtless, um, but despite that, um, it's, it's a rather daunting task to respond so quickly. Um, the first point I want to make is that children were in fact uh, long considered uh, productive members of society <laughs> even if they were to borrow from Gary Becker, who, by the way, has an interesting blog. Uh, if you can imagine this, Richard Posner and Gary Becker blog together. Uh, and if you go to their blog site, you'll find a rather extended discussion about uh, parental obligations to children. Uh, they currently are talking about uh, new laws being passed in France, which will basically fine parents uh, who don't send their chil children to school. Um, despite the uh, notion of children being durable, available goods, uh, children were productive, uh, certainly in America, in colonial America, lots of literature about the productivity of children on the prairie, in the haciendas here in California, and throughout really probably the first 80 years or so of America's Industrial Re Revolution, children were a productive part of the American economy. That they were recast, uh, redefined as non-productive members of society, uh, as Professor Arrow I think rightly claims is the contemporary view, that they were recast in this way during the last two-thirds only, I would argue, of the 20th century, indicates at least some awareness by the state, if not also by families, of a special obligation to them. Second point I want to make, um, since I'm treading into areas about which I know virtually nothing, the Bible <clears throat> does impose obligations on parents to respect and nurture their children. Uh, I did a quick search of the Bible. Um, <laughs> Parents are obliged to love their children, says a psalm. Parents should train uh, their children to know and obey God's will. Deuteronomy talks about that. I have full citations for any of you who are interested later on this evening in Bible reading. Parents should discipline and reward their children uh, as a way necessary to motivate them to do good and to avoid evil. Hebrews talks about that. Indeed, there are, there's a big discussion, lots of discussion in the Bible about disciplining your children and uh, lots of spanking websites for uh, contemporary Christians uh, on the web um, telling you about all the ways in which you are biblically instructed not to spare the rod. Um, there's also an interesting conversation about the reciprocity of the Fifth Commandment. The Fifth Commandment, it is argued by a number of theologians, apparently, John Wittenbaugh, I found one discussion by him, uh, suggests that the Fifth Amendment has absolutely no meaning unless it is understood as parents treating their children well first. 
The idea that one would respect the parent without the parent earning the respect uh, is, doesn't make any sense uh, in the, comp in the uh, context uh, of biblical readings. Third point I want to make is that I wonder what the relationship between utilities and rights and the creation of special obligations is. In particular, what sort of special obligation, as philosophers might say, should there be on the part of parents towards children? And in particular, I wonder whether or not one has to develop a clearly specified set of special rights in any sort of nation state, in ours for example, if one were to eventually develop a more enlightened sense of obligation. To put it in a slightly different way, will obligation follow the creation of rights for children which now do not currently exist? My fourth point is that there's actually an abundance of obligation talk or obligation speak when it comes to parents and children in the United States. If you Google parental obligations to children, what pops up, and this was pretty surprising, having never done this before, is a vast array of government websites dealing with the legal financial obligations of parents towards children in the event of divorce. And I explored a few of these websites. From what I could tell, every state has one of these websites. And one of the neat things about the website is that it has a website calculator in it. And you plug in the information that the calculator asks for. And I suppose this is if you're hunting for the perfect state to get divorced in to minimize your financial payoff. You plug in the financial information and other information the calculator asks you for and out pops your legally enforceable financial obligation to your children. Um, what's interesting, of course, is that the financial obligations and the entire sense or ethos of obligation in each of these state websites seem to me, at least on a quick reading of the three that I chose, I chose South Dakota, Virginia, and Massachusetts just because they sort of popped up first, but like I said, most states had one. Uh, this would be an interesting place to explore an operational state-sanctioned sense of parental obligation and the theory underlying that obligation towards children, and it might make for some kind of interesting state-by-state -state comparison. Fifth point, I suspect much of this is relatively new. That is, websites, clearly specified government calculations for parental obligations. What is less new is the field of social norms uh, to guide the behavior of parents towards their children. In particular, what is more generally called the field of etiquette. Arthur Schlesinger Sr.'s book, Learning How to Behave, A Historical Study of American Etiquette, published back in 1946. Again, this is not junior, this is dad. Um, talk about parents uh, and children. Uh, mm -hmm. Documents that as far back as Cotton Mather, uh, in a variety of speeches that Cotton Mather gave on manners in 1692, not that he necessarily had good ones himself, uh, documented significant proper forms of behavior on the part not only of children to parents, which seems quite fitting with biblical pronouncements, but also proper forms of behavior on the part of parents towards their children. More recent contemporary works, uh, for example, Amy Vanderbilt's The Complete Book of Etiquette, which if it was in a smaller form I would carry in my briefcase everywhere, um, has an entire chapter on adult-child relations. Some of the headings in this chapter are your tone of voice, conversation with children, teaching children to behave, bedtime, the use of threats, obviously biblically inspired there, interference, <laughs> is it a child's world? We shoot too high, the treatment of servants by children, which I suppose even in Irvine is somewhat out of date. Um, and then there are other chapters, there are other chapters which relate, again, to parental obligations towards children. One of the difficulties I have with thinking about parental obligation towards children is its very Western cultural assumption that's embedded in various, uh, various claims that have been made here this evening by Professor Arrow. Let me take a moment to read a piece of statutory law which rather clearly, I think, does precisely what Professor Arrow would like to see happen as a matter of public policy. This is chapter four of a body of law, article 34, entitled Obligations and Rights of Parents. Parents have the obligation and right to love, look after, rear, care for, and protect the legitimate rights and interests of their children, respect their children's opinions, attend to the education of their children so as to ensure their healthy development in all physical, intellectual, and moral aspects, so as to become dutiful children in the family and useful citizens in the society. Clause one. Clause two, parents must not discriminately treat, ill-treat, or persecute their children or hurt their honor, must not abuse their minor children in terms of work, must not incite or compel their children to act against the law and social morality. This is followed by Article 35, which I will not read, on obligations and rights of children. Where does this come from? The foundational law concerning marriage and family from May 2001 from the nation of Vietnam. 
point number four, uh, to point number seven, rather, my final point, uh, Professor Arrow suggests that the problem of children living in poverty, which is certainly a great national tragedy, in addition to the problem of children living in single parent households, is really a terrible thing that we need to address. Let me suggest on the one hand that children are probably better off today than they've probably ever been historically, at least in the Western world. One thinks of William Blake's dark satanic mills at the beginning of industrialization in England, or our own experience in this country with children working in shoe factories, textile mills, working for a dime a week, shucking oysters in the city of Baltimore. Things have gotten better. They're not perfect, but children are probably better off. The final point that I want to make is that we may not want to go where the kind of policy analysis that Professor Arrow uh, leaves with, uh, ends with rather, takes us. Because he asks uh, appropriately what to do about the never married. I'm not sure either in terms of an answer to this question, but for an illustration, uh, I turn to an individual who was very influential on constructing social policy during the eight years of the Reagan administration. Most of you are familiar, no doubt, with his work, George Gilder. George Gilder's Wealth and Poverty, which was published in 1981 and then published again a number of times, has, of course, the solution for poverty in America. Basically, the solution is this. Get married. Get married, go to church. But the predicate to getting married and going to church for Gilder is that women have to leave the workforce because they're far less productive than men, according to Gilder, and women have to stop being promiscuous. And the reason women have to stop being promiscuous, says Gilder, is because women who are promiscuous are giving away something men really, really want in order to be productive. Here's what Gilder has to say. He says, the lives of the poor all too often are governed by the rhythms of tension and release that characterize the sexual experience of young single men. Because female sexuality, as it has evolved over the millennia, is psychologically rooted in the bearing and nurturing of children, women have long horizons within their very bodies glimpses of eternity within their wombs. Civilized society is dependent upon the submission of the short-term sexuality of young men, and you know who you are, <laughs> to the extended maternal horizons of women. This is what happens in monogamous marriage. The man disciplines his sexuality and extends it into the future through the womb of a woman. <laughs> the woman gives him access to his children, otherwise forever denied him, and he gives her the product of his labor, otherwise dissipated on temporary pleasures. The woman gives him a unique link to the future and a vision of it. He gives her faithfulness and a commitment to a lifetime of hard work. If work effort is the first principle of overcoming poverty, marriage is the prime source of upwardly mobile work. And of course, Gilder in this chapter goes on to document how much more productive married men are, A, than married women, B, than single women, and they are far more productive, according to George Gilder, main advisor to the Reagan administration, who helped create an eight years of Reagan economics and the great wonders that that created, than they are towards, uh, sing, uh, towards um, single men. Um, I'm not sure that this is a road that we want to take. Uh, even if it's obviously one that's been less traveled, my advice for everybody in the room is go home tonight and hug your children and wish them well. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure what to do. Obviously, I should come and kiss Julie Margolis. I should go home and read my copy of Amy Vanderbilt's etiquette book. So um, I'm going to open the conversation to Yes, I don't know people's names, so please just identify yourself and ask your question. Okay. Uh, my name is Frank Harris. Um, father of five. <laughs> All right. of whom were born while I was in graduate school here. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, it took me so long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether I buy into Ms. Clinton's It Takes a Village, although. I have done my part in the village by coaching Mark's son, Louie. <laughs> um, but I think really when we're talking about primary responsibility there, we're not really talking about primary responsibility as much as we are talking about the fact or the supposition, which I believe is an empirical issue, that we are essentially residual claimants on the success of the children. I'm sorry, and there are some it, sort of externalities involved that we will realize from the success of these children. Now, to me, that's more of an empirical question than a statement that can be kind of laid out as matter-of-factly as was done in the book. 
And so it just seems to me that where we should be looking in terms of policy is to study how much social benefit there truly is to the success of children. And then my, my last, my, my second statement that sort of looks at the issue of why children have it so much better now, as Drogba said, in the last two thirds of the last century than they did before then. And, and I would just say that, that the value, the quality of a child's life is socially a, a social luxury that our society would, for some reason, to go back to the relative poverty of a few hundred years ago, we would probably see our children back in the mills. I, I, think, I think I'm more addressed to. Uh, the last speaker than to me. Yeah, you know, you've made just. Like to comment on Frank's statement uh, about men and uh, marriage and how men have to kind of tone down their testosterone. Oh no no no, that was Mark's statement. That was never dear. That was George Gilder's statement. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give credit where credit is due. One thing that has been recently pointed out, I think just recently, uh, at least on the news as well as other things that have been out in the publication is the length of time that people live who are married and stay faithful to each other and happy with their family, which is increasing, I'm told, because they're becoming very health aware and longevity, wanting longevity. In the vein when we're facing all this, this, uh, these questions that are posed now as to the difference in tradition. And I wanted to uh, say that I appreciate very much your remarks on on what marriage can do. I have raised seven children, and uh, unfortunately, the marriage failed after 27 years. But uh, nevertheless, the obligations remained mine. And women are taking more of an obligation today, which didn't seem to come out of anything I heard today, tonight, about the fact that women are forced by our economics to be out working and earning a second earning for, in order to support education, and that the main thing I see change since my generation is at the availability of education. And we can hand that to the Conan, who did such a good job getting junior colleges and so forth. We have uh, changed our procedures in education greatly in this last 50 years. So I would I wanted to comment based on some of the detail that I thought of while you were talking. And I'd like to hear anybody else's viewpoints on that as well, since it's a generation that has been exceedingly rapidly changed. Well, I don't know if I don't, this probably addressed more than some of the other comments that to mind, but the, uh, of course, we are better off. I mean, the general economy is going up. The general health level is going up. Um, it's been rising for a long time. Which economy is afforded? Well, it's not, it's not entirely that. The rate of growth of health is you see, more than just what can be explained by any simple econ economic thing. The fact is we've made a lot of scientific discoveries which enable us to, with, with not that much more resources, um, keep people alive the uh, longer. I mean, it's been going on. If you look, sure, the, we have, you spend enormous amounts of money on medical care now, and we can do it because we're rich. But if you go, interesting, if you look at the rate of increase of longevity, it's been, since, the, since World War II, it's been roughly uh, one-fifth of a year per year. And in that period of time, health expenditure has gone from 4% of, of GNP to 15% or 16%. Uh, so that, you'd say, that's expenditure. You look at the first half of the, 19th century, of the 20th century, longevity is growing by four-tenths of a year per year and the expenditures were 4% in 19, so I don't know what they were in 1900, but they, you know, it's only 4% in 1950. So uh, that was a result of public health measures. Basically, that was public health measures, sanitation, sewers, and things like that, and vaccination were the, were the big factors there. It's, we've had, there's been a big change. Uh, essentially, it was childhood illnesses that were being conquered then, and it's now adult and uh, uh, elderly, a disease of elderly. Which are, which contribute less to longevity, of course. Uh, so the uh, I, was, I was just saying we we got we did get a lot of increase in health, without being rich. It's another way of looking at it is to really take poor countries today. Bangladesh has a longevity of about 62. 
Uh, that's much more than England in 1900, uh, which is 35, something like that, you know. So the difference between rich countries and Bangladesh is a very poor country. Not down at the bottom, it's not an African country, but it's a poor, it's a quite a, I don't know, per capita income is maybe $2,000 a year. Um, so poor, even poor countries have achieved quite high health status. And, uh, I, that's a digression. Uh, so I'm saying it is true we want to correct this child labor, uh, the condition of children better today. Yes, but that's, everything is better today. Uh, I'm not that sure that that proves, you know, the, the question, is there any tilt, uh, differential tilt toward children? I'm not sure there is. We, we, they're more educated, they're healthier, they're, but that's, uh, so, so is everybody else. Um, uh, so I, I don't want to. But the good of the whole has been increased but, with public education. I'm sorry? But the good of the whole, it seems to me. Yes, it's increased public. I was born in 1922. Yeah. And the well, you're a child, but you're a child. I already remember things before that. But what? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I just said I was. Uh, I'm even older than you. <laughs> well, one year older. So it's okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. But the, the fact that we have been instituting so much effort and in terms of the economics of our country, and the fact that it's been increased to education, which was not given before. Education levels have gone yes. up uh, a great yeah, deal, of course, is. and uh, they had gone up a great deal. Before that, too, they were much lower in 1900 than they were in 1930 when you started going to school. Um, yes, uh, okay, I don't know, this is, uh, but uh, look, my point is that one, one trouble of dealing with, with discussing with an audience, with people like me and an audience like you, is so the, the, the real difficulties are not probably, are probably very present only to a mild extent in this particular audience. This isn't where the problems are. It's this huge number, an increasing number. It's, by the way, I didn't, I didn't mention that, but the number, the percentage of children in, uh, they are not living in two-parent households has been steadily uh, increasing. Stand. Stand. And with the, uh, yes. Do you have uh, any data or, or opinion about uh, the role of incarceration in the United States? in terms of its effect on these statistics about single-family uh, Obviously, there's two, there's obviously an linking. Exactly what it is, though, is not easy to say. It seems to be more likely that, that, the patholo that the social pathologies underlying them are common rather than one causing them. Yes, you've got a large number of potential husbands in prison, but you sort of wonder what kind of, or, Fathers, but you wonder what kind of fathers they would be if they were not in prison, right? I mean, I hate to be ca characterize it, but statistically speaking, it doesn't look like a chance. But that's, of course, a good, uh, there are a good fraction of the uh, of the fathers are uh, the, the, of, the, of the, these uh, single fa single headed families, female headed families, which are the overwhelming number of. There are father headed families, but the bulk of it is mother headed. Yes. Um, is uh, not a, uh, is a, uh, is, you know, they, were, they, were, they, if these, these were the fathers, they would probably would not be particularly good fathers. Yes. yes. Um, I just wanted to kind of pick off on those you Dr. Trotter was talking about in regards of, um, we've seen in the last couple of decades, especially now, now that there's a conservative legislative and executive focus on this, um, you talked about, somebody talked about Hillary Clinton, uh, Senator Santorum just came out with a book of his own, It Takes a Family. And so... Uh, who, who did that? I'm sorry. Senator Rick Santorum. Oh, Santorum. Uh, it's okay. Uh, he just <laughs> came out with a very uh, pointed book as a repost for Senator Clinton. So there seems to be things going on what he's saying. And some of us get something. The future policy direction can help figure out conscious social through policy to encourage you know, more subsidies to pair of households. The problem is, is that there seems to be things in this which penalize single parent households that have the version of the penalties and the benefits that they are that are withheld from them. Could you, could you repeat that? I'm afraid there's too much noise here. I couldn't really quite. You see a certain amount of this already with the way welfare reform was handled during the 1990s, in which it's really uh, put a pinch on working some mothers. And uh, if 
Senator Santorum and a few other policymakers uh, of that persuasion have their way, then we will probably see further efforts in this direction. So yes, we will probably see a renewed focus on improving uh, you know, the number of single parent, uh, excuse me, uh, dual parent households and with the reporting of social welfare benefits that entails. But are we going to penalize even more existing single parent households by the way that current policy is addressing this? Well, I don't know if Santorum's uh, opinions, though. I don't know who Senator Santorum is. I can guess quickly enough. Uh, you've given give a summary. Um, this is, of course, a fundamental dilemma you always, uh, you always rise the, uh, raise, is that if you want to create incentives for certain kinds of behavior, you create implicitly punishments for, other, for, other, for those who disobey them. And um, the difficulty, of course, is that, they're in, they're, uh, that that by itself would probably not bother anybody. The problem is there are children involved. It's, it's the innocent. It's a problem, but how do you, uh, um, uh, you know, this applies to a prison. Suppose you had a person with a, a, a good father with their, or a mother with a, with a child, and the, 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 the father's committed a crime. The child is going to suffer. But we don't usually feel that that's, uh, that's, not, that's a, not grounds for putting the father uh, He makes a very prison. valid point. The tax laws do have a, a tremendous, I think, a tremendous impact on how families conduct themselves under whatever circumstances befall them that create a strain and stress on the family. The tax laws uh, are not favorable to grandparents raising children. They're not favorable to, to a single mother. Uh, our power, poverty level in well, California, okay. the most poverty stricken people are the women who are single family residents. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, can see, single, you can see the dilemma here. Parents, you're trying to discourage single family and brothers. <laughs> you're trying to discourage single family. Let's say you let's say we agree. Maybe you don't. Let's say for the moment we agree we want to discourage single family. We want to want there the, the, to be a, a father in the house. We think of course of the content of the children. Well, if you're gonna do something which penalizes mothers, single mothers, you're gonna you're you're gonna have a problem. You're, you're torn between two aims. One is the incentive aim, and the other is the uh, welfare of the child. Maybe the women would try harder to get remarried. Well, that's right. That's what you want to intend with. Supposing you don't. You see, they're, they're they arguing, saying, is they will not, that, well, you know, that's right. In fact, that is. And that is a solution which, which occurs frequently. So we have Mike Burton. I guess it's the last now, question. As someone who has done research on and taught about the cross-cultural study of the family since the early 1960s, I want to point out that the model of the family that we're discussing here is a nuclear family of uh, father and mother and children. Mm -hmm. And um, there's recent discussion in anthropology about why people live so long. Why do we live past uh, childbearing age? And uh, the evidence is that there's evolutionary selection for long human life because of the important role that grandparents play in helping uh, their children, their grandchildren to survive. And so the fact that you can be your age rather than have died 40 uh, is because of the evolutionary selection in humans toward grandparents playing a key role in supporting the family. And a viable alternative, and a lot of the single mother families in this country, uh, grand the, the mothers of the mothers are actually uh, very much involved in buying, supplying resources and may even be living in the household. And I think the evidence about uh, the effect on the welfare of children and having uh, two adults rather than one adult in their life is it doesn't really matter what those two adults are. What it matters is that there be more than one. So it could be two, two mothers as an 11 year couple or mom and grandmother or two dads or uh, the children the child's father and the child's grandfather, uh, which is a situation I have to be personally involved in myself. And so that the way we've been thinking about the family uh, uh, 
uh, has been somewhat limited by this. The nuclear family model of the family is actually a relatively recent event in, uh, in our history, and, uh, and, and, and in most of the world, it is not the family pattern that prevails. And so I think you have to think about all the other kinds of people that are involved in flows of resources and in caregiving and uh, so forth when you, when you discuss these social issues. Your, let me just quote uh, some figures I have here. I didn't quote them. The, um, there's, there's some government, some government publication. I have to check what it is. It's a Census Bureau publication. Um, Sixty-three percent of the children under five years old were in some form of regular child care. I'm not sure. This isn't quite what you have in mind. Um, of these, of the sixty-three percent, forty-one percent um, were. Um, no, 41%, uh, uh, well, 20% of the, of the, of the preschool ch schoolers were cared for by their grandparents. Um, so it is not this, this uh, grandchild relationship is not, this is, now this is necessarily in the home. The, the, the grandparents suffer child care so the mother can go to work, I assume the typical feature is the mother goes to work. So that is um, operating, um, it is operating to some extent in our society. I have to leave it to two others to, uh, more knowledgeable to know about the um, question whether the tendency of nuclear family is something intrinsic in modernization and not easily reversible. The United States, and maybe more than other countries, is mar even more than other advanced countries, is marked by a great deal of mobility. People move all the time. They don't take, presumably they don't take your grandparent, the, the grandparents don't have their own lives and their lives that they don't necessarily go with them. So the opportunities for um, multi-generational interactions are probably more limited here. I think the average American changes counties five times um, in his or her life. Something like it's five, six times. Um, so the, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of movement in the America that's been, and there's nothing new about that. That's been part of this country from the, from the earliest days. Um, in fact, immigrant groups are probably more, many immigrants, not all, are more stable geographically, keep closer touch with their grandparents than Americans. This is not the result of immigration. Um, and it's certainly reinforced by modern, you know, uh, the regions. When GM is going downhill and laying off workers in Flint, you know, the, the grandparents may stay, but the parents, the parents are likely to move somewhere else where there's a job. Um, so I think your, your point is well taken that this may be the evolutionary situation, and, it may, and, and according to what I just read you, it's, uh, it certainly is functional to a considerable extent to this day. And um, I, I, it's interesting, the statistical analyses generally just look at the parent. At least this class would show that single family households are, are, do not perform as well as two family households. Are um, based on, uh, I don't think they ever look really at whether grandparents involved or not. Maybe you'd get a more subtle analysis if you could get that kind of data. But it seems to me that the difference is pretty striking. This is not a small difference. I don't have the figures right here. Um, and so I wonder what he, whether the grandchild thing is. It's a mitigating circumstance, but I wonder whether it's really a strong, uh, of strongly affects the main problem of the single-headed family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.